Hi, everybody. Uh, greetings from the galleries of R and Company in New York City. I'm coming to you live from my office. Um, you can see the uh, Eames unit and Pamela Ware Keaton dolls behind me. Um, I'm James Zamatis. I'm the Director of Museum Relations, and welcome to our latest Zoom discussion, which is part of a series of events in conjunction with the exhibition Born Too Tall, California Women Designers Post-War to Post-Modern, which will be on view until the final week of January. Last month, we had a wonderful panel discussion live in the gallery with the designers Wendy Mariama and Pamela Werkitan, moderated by the Yale curator, John Stuart Gordon. And this time we will focus on the lives of two designers in the show who are sadly no longer with us, Evelyn Ackerman and Jade Snow Wong. But we are delighted to have their children, Laura Ackerman Shaw and Mark Ong together with us live from their homes in California. First, a few brief <laughs> biographies of our subjects and of our guests. Uh, Mike, for the slide, please, next slide. Evelyn Lipton was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1924. She enrolled at the University of Michigan in 1941, received her BFA in 45, and then went on to get her MFA at Wayne University. In 1948, Evelyn met Jerry Ackerman, who had grown up nearby but whose studies had been interrupted by the Second World War. Jerry had served in the Air Force in Europe from 1941 through 1946. The couple fell in love, quickly married, and began a lifelong partnership. Next slide. Jerry went back to school on the GI Bill. He graduated from Wayne State and then moved on to the prestigious ceramics program at Alfred in New York for his MFA. After a visit to LA, where Jerry's parents had moved, and where the young couple met many California designers and makers, including the legendary husband and wife ceramics team, Gertrude and Otto Natzler, and inspired by the Los Angeles practice of Charles and Ray Eames, and by an exhibition they saw in Detroit, which was curated by Alexander Girard and was part of the American institutional good design movement, and which featured as an aside, by the way, the ceramics of Jade Snow Wong in it, the Ackermans moved to Los Angeles in 1952 and opened a studio to sell affordable home accessories. They named it Genev Design Studio. And at first it was known for Jerry's lines of slip cast ceramics. Um, on the left here, for example, uh, Jerry designed the vases and Evelyn added the scraffito decoration. Uh, and we have a great photo of them on the right. Evelyn started designing glass mosaics and she began to employ a team of Mexican-based artisans to execute the works to keep up with demand. Let's go to the next slide. Here is the famed ellipses mosaic circa 1958. This one here is in the collection of LACMA and was included in their California design exhibition in 2013. This led to their second company, ERA Industries and the development of Evelyn's line of tapestries. They would soon ramp up and open the first of several showrooms in LA's design district where they sold to the trade, i.e. department stores, furniture showrooms, architects, interior designers. As Glenn Adamson once wrote, the Ackermans lived the designer craftsman ethos to its fullest extent, producing an incredible range of media, and they found the suburbs to be a ready market for their work. Although Evelyn studied weaving in school, ERA Industries was always focused on mass production, and thus they worked with a community of weavers in Mexico on the wall hangings, where the wool tapestries were woven by hand, following a full-size drawing color keyed to yarn samples. Next slide. So here's, a, here's an installation view. <laughs> uh, our talking heads might be in, a, in, the, in the middle of this, but. Um, on the right hand side is an installation shot of our show downstairs and uh, one of the tapestries here, which I've highlighted on the left, is um, Cat and Bird, one of Evelyn's most popular textiles, which was retailed through places like Macy's. And another example of which is in the collection of the Long Beach Art Museum today. This is one of several Ackerman textiles, which have been made popular all over again, starting in the 1990s really, in what I would categorize as the Palm Springs based revival of mid-century modern style. And it's been appropriated by such retro artists as Shag. 
Um, next slide too, please. And here um, up close and then a, a little bit more of a distant shot is an example of one of the cartoons that Evelyn would um, do and then send down with instructions to be converted into the textiles there. And in our archival uh, wing of the gallery, we are so thrilled to have several examples of these on loan from Ackerman Modern. Um, let's go to the next slide. Here. Evelyn's work along with Jerry's, it was a constant presence in the California Design Exhibition Series organized by the Pasadena Art Museum from 1954 to 1976. Much loved today by dealers and museum curators, the California design catalogs evolved from being mostly stocked with LA designers working in the mid-century modern good design mode to a much funkier craft-centric presentation drawing from the entire state. And really, Evelyn's work in so many mediums evolved with that change in tone. Moving ahead here, um, in the 1980s, Evelyn would complete her final masterwork, Stories from the Bible, an exquisite series of 40 cloisonne enamels, which are now in the collection of the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian. Evelyn was also a passionate collector and expert in antique dolls and toys, and she authored numerous collecting guidebooks. The Ackermans were the subject of exhibitions at the Mingay International Museum in San Diego in 2009 and the Craft and Folk Art Museum in Los Angeles in 2011. Evelyn died in 2012. A publication on their life together, hand in hand, with contributions from a host of scholars was published in 2014. And with me here is Laura Ackerman Shaw. Laura, Hi, born and raised in LA, and um, who has been lived most of her adult life actually in the Bay Area. Um, Laura has both her bachelor and master's degrees in English literature from Stanford. After more than 30 years as a director in the publishing industry, managing design, editorial, production, translation, and print, Laura happily became the steward of her parents' design legacy and archives. She has given presentations and written about her parents' life and work at events such as the Palm Spring Modernism Week. And with the renewed interest in her parents' designs, she's been pursuing licensing options to bring their work to a new audience, beginning with a successful Genev Ceramics capsule collection collaboration with Design Within Reach. And, and all of this is on her beautifully maintained website, ackermanmodern.com. Next slide, please. Ah, and I forgot about that. This is, <laughs> this is Laura in the, what, about 66, 1967 with your mom? 1963, the park across the street from our house. Ah. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Jade Snow Wong was born in 1922 and raised in San Francisco in an immigrant family that held traditional beliefs and customs of Chinese culture. As Jade put it, she was living in a subdued ghetto environment, isolated by the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, like, i.e. Chinatown. She attended Mills College, where she studied economics and sociology with the intent of becoming a social worker. As part of her studies, since social workers were expected to organize craft classes, she enrolled in a ceramics class taught by Carlton Ball, one of the most legendary teachers in California craft history. It was the moment that changed her life. After her studies at Mills, um, she received her BA in 42, but continued to be an active member of the Mills ceramic community throughout the 40s, attending seminars given by Bernard Leach, among others. Jade began her professional pottery career with a ceramics workshop located in the windows of a Chinatown store. The very act of her making pots, which she would then transfer our transport to the Mills College kilns for firing, attracted huge crowds and led to sales to Americans, as she put it, outside of the local community, which remained skeptical of her philosophical fusion of academic studies and hard work with her hands. She expanded her business, moved into a larger studio, which she rented from her father, and she began wholesaling her work to department stores. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on 
a promotional shot on the left and on the right is a rather poor shot of mine from our exhibition with Jade's ceramics in the foreground there next to vessels by Marguerite Wildenhain. Um, Jade's ceramics were loaned to us by the great Berkeley-based collector Forrest Merrill, who has long been a champion of her work. Jade also began to work in enamel, which she'd also learned from Carlton Ball, and which over time began to eclipse her ceramics in terms of its commercial success. She'd also met Woodrow Ong, who grew up in Chinatown too. After serving in the army in the Asian theater during World War II, Woody was strolling through the neighborhood when he saw Jade at the wheel in the shop window. They were married in 1950. Woody Ong took pottery classes too at Mills, and he was a silversmith. And most importantly for their business, he began to spin copper forms on a lathe for their enamel housewares business. Now let's go to the next slide, please. So here's Jade and Woody on the left, and on the right is a classic example of her enamel work. Uh, this one's in the collection of Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, multiple enamel pieces by Jade Snow Wong have recently entered museum collections thanks to gifts by the Enamel Arts Society. In 1947, Jade's luminous enamel bowls were selected by the MoMA curator, Edgar Kaufman, to be included in one of his good design shows, 100 Useful Objects of Fine Design, which is the show where the museum upped the threshold of price to $100 and under, and where the exhibition itself was designed by Mies van der Rohe. Jade's classic 10 and a quarter inch fruit bowl was listed at $14.50. In 1948, one of her enamel bowls was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art after it was exhibited at the Ceramics National in Syracuse, um, uh, a very popular and important venue where um, um, uh, at Jerome Ackerman was also exhibiting as well a little bit later in the 50s. In 1950, Jade became famous with the publication of her memoir, Fifth Chinese Daughter, I'm holding it up right here, which told the story of her childhood in Chinatown, her self-discovery as an artist and her triumph over the skepticism of her parents. Our exhibition takes its title from a chapter in the memoir. And this is an early edition I'm holding up here, signed by Jade, uh, found it online, I, I treasure it. it. It's been a massive global success for decades. Jade received a solo exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago in 52, organized by Charles Kelly, the curator of Oriental Art there. The show traveled to four additional major museums and when it was over with, Jade somewhat remarkably left all the works from the exhibition in their crates for many decades. The works would resurface when she was 80 years old and a retrospective exhibition and accompanying publication was organized by the Chinese Historical Society of America in 2002, this catalog right here. After the success of her memoir, let's go to the next slide please. Jade served as an American cultural ambassador for the State Department starting in the 50s, making numerous trips to Asia where she met with ceramic masters in China, Japan, and Korea, and elsewhere. She kept producing enamels into the 21st century. Also somewhat remarkably, she and Woody found the time to run a travel business together for decades, organizing Asian tours. She received an honorary doctorate from Mills in 1976, and she died in 2006. And I am honored to be joined by her son, Mark Stewart Ong. He is a graphic designer born in San Francisco and still living in that city. He has been a freelance book designer since 1983 and has designed books in every genre from scholarly books to trade books to art books, such as this incredible catalog. Um, he is the eldest of Jade Snow Wong's four children. He grew up in the loft above his parents' studio. After the family moved to a house, Mark continued to do the metal spinning, buffing, packing, and mailing of shipments. He continued to polish her enamels well into his 50s. As the co-executor of his mom's estate, Mark placed her papers at the Library of Congress and oversaw the donation of 40 of her pieces to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco which is by far the largest public collection of her work. And on the right here, I just wanted to show, I had to include a photo of this amazing contemporary mural on Hyde Street in San Francisco by the artist Jennifer Wolford, which reps Asian American artists who worked in the Bay Area. And I just love the image here of Jade Snow Wong in, in that cartoon bubble um, in front of her vessels next to Ruth Asawa's hangings. Mark and Laura, let's move to the next slide, please. 
The fact that you are here together on Zoom is a testament to your friendship, which actually came about because of your own careers and not because you met at a museum opening or anything related to your parents' original career. Um, well, tell us about how that all came about. Mark, I'll let you talk. <laughs> well, Laura, Laura hired me. I was a freelance book designer and someone recommended me to her and uh, I showed her my portfolio and we started working together. So that's how we met. And only after we were working together did we discover our common heritage. And that was really thrilling. Laura. And we actually managed to get Jade and my mom and dad together for dinner one time when they came up to visit me. So that was really lovely because they knew of each other, but I don't think they had ever met partially because of the Southern California, Northern California sort of divide in the craft circles, so. And the craft circles were of course very much, um, like especially in, you know, in, in Mills College, but it was very much based on sort of like the college, the schools where people could actually study and, and be with their professors, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, a lot of it, you know, one of the things that is interesting about Mark's mom and my mom is that so many people in this arena taught to make a living and our parents in their their with you know both fathers and mothers um they made a living by making products and they weren't professors like you know my dad was friends with peter volkus and you know margaret wildenheim and and these people were teaching regularly and so I think that's a very interesting thing. I think Mark and I have discovered a lot of parallels we didn't realize even just in our recent conversations in preparation for this convert, this event today. Yeah, and I might just give a shout out to the beauty and importance of education. And I don't know that that exists in our current time, but for my mother to go to college, not expecting to learn art, but to be inspired by the teachers there and teachers of such great caliber, and to be able to rely on the college uh, and go back to the guild and continue learning was a tremendous opportunity. And it's an illustration of how important education is. And I lament the fact that art is often discarded now in education as being frivolous, but this shows you how important it is to have a good education. What kind of, how would you categorize her relationship with Carlton Ball? Um, was it, was it, I mean, <laughs> was it very, I don't know, stuck in sort of the social mores of the time? Was it very open in terms of their, their, um, their friendship? I think he was very influential on her. And you have to understand from a Chinese standpoint, you're supposed to revere your teachers. But he was anything but a Confucian teacher because as she described him to me, he was wild, um, impulsive, but also very demanding and had super high standards. So I think it was heady for her to have somebody who was a teacher with that authority, but also who was constantly advocating for creative freedom. And I think that was very important to her own expansion as a person. And his, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I saw this and I, I meant to go back to it. Is it true that the actual illustrator of this book was his wife, Catherine Uhl at the time. Right, and um, my mother described her as being a very gentle and kind person. And of course, um, I, I don't know, of course, but Carlton Ball left her for another woman. No. And that sent a huge kind of shock through everything. And Catherine was forgiving and understanding about it. But, you know, I was referring to how different Carlton Ball was from an average Chinese teacher, and this affected everybody. But I don't think it changed her regard for him as a teacher. Right. And Laura, I didn't cover your mother's educational influences um, and background at all in my introduction. Perhaps we could, um, uh, you could get into this a little bit with us as well, considering, as Mark said, that incredible role that education played uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. Well, I think one of the things important to note is our parents did not grow up in artistic households. There was no exposure to art. 
Um, my mother was just a few miles from the Detroit Institute of Art. They never went there. Um, so for these women, and I'm sure that they are not the only examples, to have forged a path successfully on their own with no encouragement, no background, uh, is pretty enormous. I mean, my parents did always told me they used to draw all the time. As a matter of fact, I have some of my dad's Wizard of Oz books, and they have scribbles all over them, like drawings of cows. And, um, you know, for my mom, she started at University of Michigan, and then the war broke out, and her three older brothers, so um, our mothers are both one of five. Uh, my mom had three older brothers and a twin sister, and her brothers left, and her mother summoned her home and said, you have to be with me. Her father had passed away and she transferred to Wayne. And she said that was the best thing she ever did because there were all these exciting new professors from University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. But her big influence was this art history professor, Ernst Shire. She took 11 classes from him. Wow. And then she discovered Matisse and Cezanne, Rembrandt, the Dutch masters, the expressionists, the Fauvists, she had such a wide range of love for these varying things. And she embraced tribal art, folk art, um, early primitive pieces. So she had a very wide ranging influence and interest level, which I think you see in her style, which can range from sort of biomorphism to more abstract or geometric to sort of more Bjorn Winblad whimsical. Right, right. Um, she was a very good illustrator. Um, so a lot of that translated, I think, for her. But it wasn't until she got to college that she really had any exposure. Now, your, your parents had a whirlwind courtship, which is not atypical from that time, you know, sort of a, a six month sort of like love affair ending in marriage. Just did your mother accompany your dad then to Alfred before they yes. then head out west? So what happened was they met once at Wayne. My dad went to the Naval Ordinance and then eventually went to the European Theater. Um, and sometime later when he came back, a friend said, oh, you should meet this beautiful woman who works at this design studio. And my dad, ever suave and somewhat corny, showed up with, uh, you know, was driving by and showed up and happened to have a Milky Way in his pocket. And my mother, of course, said, well, we've met before at Wayne. And he said, well, you know, a little thing like World War II intervened. And he definitely pulled out a Milky Way bar and said, do you like these? And she said, well, it's my favorite. And then ensued this courtship. Um, but it's interesting because my mom had lots of suitors and my dad is the one she fell in love with. And she told me she would have married him the first day she met him because he was funny and he was warm and he was kind and he was intelligent. And they were really truly partners. And I think Mark would say the same thing about his parents is that this concept of partnership, tremendous respect for each other, for each other's work, the collaborative nature of being married. My parents were married for 64 years. And working together in their entire married lives is pretty unusual. And so they got married in 1948. They met in 48 and they got married in September of 48. Man. Um, and then they moved to California in 52 <laughs> because they decided that they could do what these other people were doing that they had seen at the DIA Alexander Girard exhibit. Right, right, exactly. Michael, why don't you put up the next slide while I ask mark a question that is perfectly follows up on on the subject of partnerships here um what do you got there michael you got to, but at any rate mark i'm fascinated by the role of your dad in both the development of glazes as well as his making on the lathe of the mostly copper bowls for the successful enamelware business in many ways Considering his similar experience at Mills, this could be seen um, as a partnership similar to that of Gertrude and Otto Natzler. Yet, unlike the Natzlers, Woody Ong is not given authorship credit to specific pieces on which he might have been a co-designer. Was this an intentional business decision since your mom had found fame with her best-selling memoir at the beginning of their marriage? Um, and was he content to remain in the background, receiving tremendous credit from your mother in her later writings? 
Well, I think the way the uh, forms were created for the lathe is that my mother would throw a piece of pottery and my father would reproduce that. Now to do a metal spinning, you need what's called a chuck, which is a wooden form in the shape of that bowl and that goes on the lathe and then the copper is gradually molded to that shape. So there was that kind of collaboration, um, that kind of initiation on her part and so on. I think they did decide that he was going to be supportive of her um, and their work. And I think that's remarkable in terms of his personality. But you mentioned the travel agency and that was another way for him to have quote his own business. So the travel agency was really his business and then the roles were reversed. Uh, she played the part of like a secretary and so on. Um, she led the tours with him, <laughs> but that was the kind of exchange that they had. And a lot of what he did is invisible to the bowls, right? He did all the bookkeeping, he did all the business decisions, he did a lot of the uh, relationships with vendors and so on. So his role in her life was immeasurable. It just isn't credited on the pieces themselves. Right. And it, it, it's interesting because, you know, your mom contributed quite a lot of her own um, original writing again near the end of her life um, to that uh, exhibition catalog that came out uh, in San Francisco in the early 2000s. And there's this one line that, you know, she writes in there that, about Chinese culture's relentless subjugation of women. And, and it does seem like in terms of how their partnership, you know, from the very beginning um, was, was the antithesis of what she'd experienced growing up in the 40s and before she, that. She really did need him emotionally. There were times that I saw her really stressed and upset. And he would turn to her and say, it's going to be okay. And her shoulders would drop and she would mm -hmm. sigh and everything would be fine. Now, I don't know what it's like to just have someone say, it's okay, and then all your troubles are over. But she really depended on him in that way. After he died in 1985. Now, like, and it's funny because I'm just curious, this is an aside that I hadn't really thought about until just, you know, right now. The book was immensely popular. And obviously it was, it was reviewed in the New York Times. It, you know, it launched their career of working with the State Department, but did they not see a lot of uh, income from the publication of her memoir? Uh, no, I, I think they struggled financially for many, many years. Um, I know they had to borrow money and there was one traumatic time in the 70s in which the store was robbed and they lost something like $30,000 and that was really hard to recover. There was also a time when President Johnson uh, had an embargo on uh, travel and that nearly killed their business. So they did have a lot of financial struggle. Oh, because, because of the Vietnam War in terms of- right. right. I understand. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Michael. Now, Laura, speaking of these, of, of, of supporting each other um, and, and running businesses together and having defined roles, your father moved away from ceramic production at the end of the 1950s and, and focused on running the business, ERA Industries. Um, perhaps, perhaps you could touch briefly on how your parents divided up responsibilities in the 1960s, um, uh, especially, you know, obviously that was during your childhood. Did that play a role in terms of your mom being a mom as well at that point? Yeah, I think, you know, Mark and I were sort of talking late last night a little bit, and this concept of being a woman in that era and having this role as artist, craftsman, designers, however you want to articulate that, and being married and being mothers and the expectations. My family is Jewish. So, you know, we have the same sort of um, immigrant background. And I think that's really kind of fascinating when you look at sort of American success stories. Um, my mom was always there for me, which was wonderful. She made me Halloween costumes. Uh, she was told by her doctor in 1964 to stop smoking. And that led to her building a dollhouse for me and making, you know, she needle pointed miniature tapestries and rugs for it and made tiny enamel 
plates for it and hand fired her own bricks. Um, yeah. It was pretty amazing. And I think for her, the idea of working and being a parent, I was born 11 years after they were married. And I think my mother had had a number of, you know, unsuccessful attempts and they were very grateful to have me and they were very wonderful. And I think what happened was this idea of designing for small domestic scale. I mean, a lot of my parents' pieces did go into office buildings and, and this piece that you have up the launch pad is 44 by 70 inches. But the idea of designing for the home and as my parents said, to make beautiful, affordable objects for young couples like themselves. So this whole post-World War II generation that moved west, that was looking for opportunity, that was optimistic. Um, I think our parents were tenacious, hardworking. My parents had no money. They worked seven days a week. And if you listen to them, probably 24 hours a day when they first started their business. But my mom would often stay home designing. She was very shy. My dad was very gregarious. She didn't like to be in the spotlight. So she would stay home and design incredible numbers of pieces in a very short period of time because they also have this trade show cycle and, and sales reps across the country who every six months need a new product. So if you think about in that era, concepting something, drawing it, consulting with my dad, they would collaborate. And my dad really did run the business. So he did occasionally design pieces and they always worked on them I think together in the sense of was this a marketable piece or, or an audience appropriate piece. Um, but my dad was the one who did all the sales calls to, you know, Victor Gruen's office or to Richard Meyer um, or to, you know, Luckman. And my mom would just basically churn out these wonderful pieces and then, and then do things for me. Like she made all the bulletin boards at my school. She designed she uh, created these finger puppets for me as a kid, and then she used oh, them. I have a photo of that later, actually, I'll show at the end. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they became a, a, a sort of a fundraiser for my preschool. So I think that she did a remarkable job of balancing, and my parents did a remarkable job of creating and sustaining a business that played to their individual strengths. And well, from the domestic to then maybe the iconic, let's just talk briefly because I, I just want to have for those of us who are uh, watching who are not 100% familiar with um, Ackerman's most famous tapestries, we have here Launchpad in front of us. On the left, both of these are in the estate in your collection. On the left is, is, is an example that was shown at LACMA. Um, in their California design exhibition. And on the right is an example that is actually in our gallery right now. Um, talk to us a little bit about, not so much necessarily the production, but like the, the, the thematic um, you know, concept behind something like the launch pad here. And, and why are we looking at two different versions, for example? Well, my mom designed this in 1970 after the moon launch. Yeah. That was her inspiration. So this is a very abstracted concept, I think, of a rocket ship. Yeah. Um, in their market, because they were working with interior designers and architects and people like that, they had a very broad range of clients from the traditional to the contemporary. So their wood pieces, for example, probably worked well in any kind of setting. They were often used in restaurants and things of that nature. The tapestries range from traditional to very contemporary, like this example. They right. also imported Finnish tacanas and um, European goblins for other mark, you know, to offer a broader representation. But you know, you had warm and cool color tones in so many areas. So my mother would often leverage a design into two different colorways so that there were options for people to choose from. And she had a great eye for color and pattern. And they also did something else, which was very interesting, was they would take a design and adapt it across media. So for example, the flower garden that was in that opening slide that's in the exhibition was also done as a mosaic. And so if a design was successful, they would continue to produce it. If it didn't sell, they stopped producing. It was very much a supply and demand kind of uh, creation. And so she would do these 
kind of pencil sketches that you showed earlier. Right. She'd create a full size template, and those would all be mailed off to either the weavers in uh, Mexico or the hand hooking group that they worked with in Japan or uh, the Italian artists that cast their hardware. And they would get a sample back and they would approve it or change it. And then they would place an order for eight or 10 or 12 of the pieces. And do you have any idea in terms of fashion? Yeah. Do you have any idea in terms of like your family's records, like, like how many total of the most popular um, example do you think was, was made and thus, you know, distributed around the country? I only have uh, records of inventories from the 70s. Um, and I can see that something like the Campesina that was on the cover of the book that you mentioned, right. um, they produced a great deal of those, probably, you know, 100. I don't know. I'd have to go back and actually tally it up. Right. Um, there are pieces that where they maybe produced a couple of dozen. And maybe, you know, maybe there's more than 100. Also, some of them turned into special commissions or my mom would do a special commission that was a one-off. So, you know, because everything was handcrafted, it, it took a long time to get pieces, right? And you couldn't make a lot of them. And for example, this piece is 44 by 70 because that is the maximum size of the loom from the weavers in Mexico. Right. So and they... And they were, they did do, you know, they would standardize sizes to be more efficient. I think they really subscribed to the Bauhaus philosophy of it wasn't a crime to have other people or processes help you create a product. Right. And it's, it's amazing to me because, you know, this present launch pad design, which was, you know, featured at one point in the California design exhibition um, and and I think has become quite iconic, yet it is so incredibly scarce today. You know, we, I think we first met because it turned out that our gallery had sold an example of this in Paris in like 2002 or something. And, and yeah. we can't, we can't trace it today. And, and, and you, you know, there's just, it, only a few have come up really on the secondary market recently. Um, Mark, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to shift gears just a second. Oh, I, I put it here. This is <laughs> so obviously your mom's standing in front of Launchpad on the left here, and then those incredible finger puppets that you. That, um, is that you, or is that just a? No, mom? it's unfortunately it's my uh, stunt double. <laughs> <laughs> it's from you know Better Homes and Gardens or House and Garden. I can't remember from 1965 when they featured them after they were in the California Design Exhibition. Did your mom ever become friendly over the years with Alexander Girard? Because there is such an interesting parallel, I think, between his collecting and what he was working on and then what she was working on. They both had tremendous interest in folk art. I, they yeah. met him. They didn't were not friends with him. He was not in the same circles right. as the people that they tended to be with. Um, there were a lot of a lot of people in this era who went to Cranbrook, my parents couldn't afford to go to Cranbrook. Right. So they weren't part of that group. Right? Yeah, they went to public, obviously. Yep. Right. Exactly. Let's move to the next slide, Michael. Thank you very much. Mark, your mother writes in the later 21st century catalog, I had no exposure to art. Chinese or American, or to museums as I was growing up in my parents' environment, i.e. in Chinatown before she studied at Mills. From what I've seen of her ceramics and enamels produced in the 1940s, there's a strong modernist influence, um, influenced by Carlton Ball and with an eye towards the good design movement of the 1940s. Your mom also writes about attending a glaze chemistry seminar at Mills given by Bernard Leach, and then, of course, after the success of her memoir, your mom and dad make a 44 stop tour in Asia on behalf of the State Department in 1953. Is this, these works here, the, the one that is done in a salt fired blaze on the left, the other on the right date to the very early 1950s. Is this where, is that, is it, was it the State Department tour where your mom 
uh, received her first major exposure to Chinese and Japanese and Korean forms and glazes. Would you say that this is where her work begins to radically evolve in terms of the influence of Asian art history or, or was it always there? Um, yes, I think um, she traveled with pieces on the State Department tour, but there were all sorts of people in each country who would come to see her, sometimes in a very challenging fashion, like why should we look at these ceramics when we have our own ceramics? Right. And so I think it was not just educational, but it was somewhat confrontational as well. And she had to ask herself where her ceramics fit in terms of the world art history. Um, but I know she was highly influenced by Song Dynasty ceramics and the beauty of form and color fused together. And that happened to intersect with what you're calling a modernist approach um, in various times in Chinese uh, pottery history, there were moments in which the ceramics and were not decorated, were not thin in porcelain, but were heavier. And I think she really prized that. Very right. nice. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Michael. Um, and this here, um, I selected it not just because it's it's just so incredible, but this is a, for your mom, a relatively late example of her ceramic. I think it dates to, I think it's 1981 or 1982, I think it was on it. Um, um, actually, 1975, excuse me. Just wanted to double check on that. So did your mom, although the commercial aspect of what she was producing, um, evolved into a, you know, a heavier focus on enamels. Um, did she continue to revisit the wheel at various points? Is this here one of her late masterworks, you might say? Was there a point when she just completely stopped on the ceramic side? So I think there were two halves of her um, pottery production. They, she did have um, you know, standard items that she made and the quartz uh, the bowls that have quartz on the bottom are examples of that. And, but she always continued to do one-off ceramics. And this is an example of that as well. I think past the 70s, she stopped doing production ceramics and just mostly did one-off ceramics. And then when she moved her studio in 1986, she made the decision to start, um, you know, to discontinue the ceramics and just pursue enamels. So that was the division there. There wouldn't be any, there shouldn't be any pottery claimed after, say, 1986. And were the one-off ceramics made for um, passionate repeat collector customers who would come by? Or was it mostly, at that point, personal? Obviously, this one remained within your family, for example. Well, no, no. They were always put up for sale, and there uh -huh. would be collectors and so on. So there wasn't a time where she was making ceramics just for her own collection or her own pleasure. That was never her orientation. Everything was made um, and offered for sale at the studio. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Michael. And here um, we have two examples of your mom's enamel work. The one on the left, um, early from the 1950s, the one on the right, much later from the 1990s. Um, obviously, in terms of reproducing images on screen for us to look at here, it can be very hard to see the, um, the complexities of the firing and the differences in color and composition. But that said, um, you know, super quick connoisseurship lesson I would love to have for, for everyone here. Um, first of all, in terms of, you know, how, what's an easy way to sort of quickly date this work um, you know, from an eye point of if I were to find one of these bowls, because, you know, for the most part, unless your mom was actually inscribing it to somebody, they're not dated these works. So quick test, turn it over, look at the bottom. If it's mirror polished on the bottom, it was pretty early. Sometime in like the 60s or 70s, they made a decision to satin polish them. So that's a quick division that you can use to see how early a bowl might be. And when it comes to work that is unsigned by her, obviously that means she didn't make it, but I guess 
the question I don't I, I, I don't quite always understand. Obviously, you were you were there. You were um, working on the finishing of these wares for many years. Um, did that does that mean that those are works that were unsigned that were uh, retailed in a different way or no, like explain no. that process, especially since there were some um, prominent uh, students who trained with your mom, for example, like winning in the 1960s. They were not just students who trained there, but she had for a while she had a staff making ceramics or making enamels to be more right. exact. And so but anybody could fool around. Right? Yeah. And, and I did and my my siblings did um, cousins and, you know, brothers and sisters of my mother and so on. Anybody could come in and just make an enamel, but they yeah. wouldn't be signed by my mother. So you might find a piece. Um, in fact, my cousin just gave me one that was obviously not done by her, but it's still an enamel on copper. So you you have to depend on the signature to show that it's hers and not a student or another person. And in those later years, um, uh, especially in the 1980s, 1990s, into the early 2000s, where did you find this work? Was it at that point always going to a place like like Gump's or was there was there a was it just still through her studio at that point? I think from the 70s to the 80s, she was still wholesaling at places like Gump's and right. Newman Markets and Bullock's and so on. But I think that tapered off. And by, say, the, oh, I'd say by the mid 90s into the 2000s and past, it was really just through her studio. Now, I just received a tremendous collect, uh, question here online um, from the great Pamela Weir Keaton, who's, who's listening in on this. And her question for both of you, um, I guess we'll start with Laura, is how did growing up with your creative parents inform who you are today? Uh, what's, what's like your number one takeaway from that? Wow, that's a great question, Pamela. Um, well, I grew up, like Mark, working for my parents. I didn't um, really plan it that way, but I got to stamp catalogs when I was very little, and then I moved on to selling in the showroom and stuff. But I think what it did was it created an incredible appreciation for art for me. I'm a competent artist. I am not anybody I would hire in the way that I hired Mark or that our parents were talented. Um, we would go to I would, would go to museums with my mom and dad because they made up, I think, for what their childhood lacked. And they always told me to pick the piece that spoke to me that I would want to take home and live with. And I think that has created for me a tremendous appreciation for it doesn't have to be the famous artist. It has to be the artist or the piece that evokes an emotional response for you. And so one of the things that it's allowed me to do as the steward of their legacy is I endowed a scholarship at Wayne University for an art student, an undergrad student in my parents' name. Wow. And it's already had three recipients. And I endowed an internship at the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum in my dad's name. And so that allows me to pay it forward and honor my parents and their work. And that, to me, is sort of my lasting takeaway. And before I, I turn to Mark, um, we have a follow-up question, which is actually what I was going to answer, ask as well. And we'll sort of put them to, the two together. Uh, from Juan Salazar, he, he asks, um, any future additions to the Hand in Hand exhibition catalog, but also any additional plans for museums? And so I guess my question that I was going to ask as well would be, um, considering the great work that was done um, in the early, to, early 2000s to the early 2010s um, on your parents' legacy, what would you love to see next in terms of a, a great next step, whether it's geographical or thematic in terms of, you know, institutional coverage? Well, I think the fact that you brought an exhibition to New York is a really important first step. I think our parents are so well known in California and even the West Coast. And to bring this California mid-century modernism more broadly across the country is really important. 
and informative. Um, I would love to see another exhibition I really focused more on process than chronological because we have all these incredible maquettes and molds and everything else. And I think for educational purposes, for an audience to see how something was concepted and what it actually turns out to be and how that process happened is really fascinating. Um, I'd love to see a second edition of Hand in Hand. It's a, it represents a small body of my parents' work. We do not have a catalog raisonné, which I suppose as part of the archival process, we really yeah. need to work on. It's awesome. Um, yeah. And then eventually I'd like to find homes for the archives, for the ephemera and the objects. So mm -hmm. that's a very long-term strategy. And I, I have to note, uh, you know, at the same time that there's been perhaps um, less institutional coverage of your parents' work over, say, the last you know, four or five years, there has that has sort of dovetailed with this actually resurgence in prices on the secondary market, um, especially like in the right Rego Lama empire for mosaics and, and, and textiles in particular. Um, to you, Mark, uh, to go back to Pamela's first question, um, the big takeaway, growing up with your mom, growing up with your dad, how did it inform who you are today? So if I had to pick just one thing, it would be the importance of the creative process. And what I learned over and over again is that you had to do every step right. If you didn't wedge the clay well and there was an air bubble in it, that piece might blow up weeks later in the kiln. My mother once took me aside and said she counted 13 times in the creation of a bowl in which something could go wrong. And I saw that repeatedly. Just because you threw, say, 30 pieces doesn't mean that all 30 pieces are going to come through the firing. And there were times when the whole kiln would blow up and all the pieces would be ruined and it would be devastating to my mother. And then she would just start again. That kind of perseverance and patience, acceptance of mistakes, acceptance of accident was a really powerful lesson to me. And I rely on it to this day. And one of the things I've also been just so impressed with is um, obviously, as I previously mentioned, um, a large gift of your mom's work was made um, by you to the Asian Art Museum. And, and their website, I think, is excellent in terms of, of educational outreach to the community and, and, and those who are actually going to the museum there. Um, that said, um, you know, about a year and a half ago, your mom was included in a article in New York Times where they polled leading art historians and experts about like, who are the great uh, designers of the 20th century who need to be rediscovered. And, and Glenn Adamson wrote eloquently about, about your mom in that particular circumstance. And I'm, I'm somewhat astonished always when looking around at museum collections today that had your, your mom's work dating all the way back to the early 50s and how it's, it's not out, it's not even illustrated online. Um, what in your what would you love to see moving forward as a next step in preserving your mom's legacy institutionally, nationally, et cetera? Well, I'd love to see the Asian Mountain exhibit with um, since they have her pieces, um, they are building a new Asian American wing. So I'm hopeful that they might be able to exhibit some of the pieces there. Beyond that, I hope that people could remember that she wasn't just a ceramicist, but she was a writer as right. well. And to understand that a person doesn't have to be constrained to one medium, that it's the importance of the person that people should really follow. And I think she could inspire a lot of women and young artists to come. And it's interesting because you donated her papers to the Library of Congress. You know, perhaps it is someplace like the Smithsonian where they have so many multiple museums, different curators, different experts, where, you know, it's that kind of large scale institution where uh, something like that could come together. Um, and it, it is interesting because there, that's, it's not just your mom that at the Smithsonian is sometimes 
uh, you know, that, that kind of material is buried. I think of the Natzlers, you know, their own ceramic wheel and everything like that was, was donated to, to the uh, Archives of American Art. I, I don't know if it's ever been out. Um, and, and so I, I fully agree with you on, on, on that concept, something that's much more overarching about her career. Um, it's two o'clock, that blew by. Um, like very fast. I never quite understand if like our Zoom might get cut off in another minute or two, but um, I, I so enjoyed this conversation. Um, I have, it's been such a pleasure, uh, Laura, to have you here in the galleries uh, last month um, on, on multiple occasions when we opened the show. Uh, Mark, I, I sincerely hope that I do get to meet you at some point in person soon, at some point. Um, any final thoughts? before we sign off. Laura, I'll let you go first. <laughs> I think it's, this is a wonderful opportunity to reintroduce our, our mother's phenomenal talents to a wider audience and to hopefully engender some more curiosity about their lives and work because I think they were multifaceted, multifaceted women who had tremendous talent and ethics and commitment to hard work, um, as Mark was mentioning. And I, and I think the fact that they were also incredibly wonderful people um, with a, a wide cadre of friends um, speaks a lot to the values they brought to their business approach. Well said, well said. Mark, uh, any final before we say goodbye? So James, thank you for this opportunity and thank you all the people who have attended. I think as I look at our mother's work today, I see them both as a product of their era. It won't come again. That post-World War II era where people could say, I can do anything, that doesn't exist anymore. And so I see the products as I see the pieces as the products of their era, but I also think that all the pieces managed to achieve that wonderful quality in art in which the art becomes transcendent of its time. It's both of its time and it's also timeless. And that speaks to the dedication and the artistic perception of our mothers. And I think that that really recommends all those pieces to all of you. So I thank you again for listening. Well, thank you. Yes, both. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel. We'll be getting the word out to many of those who could not be with us today um, so that they can listen to your eloquent words, both of you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll, I'll see you soon. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye Thank you. now.